comments uh, and meet individually with uh, applicants um, uh, or the participants on the on the HCP on this. So today is, uh, you know, just uh, not decision making, um, just an informational uh, briefing, and then you know, uh, opportunity to ask questions on all the different uh, projects and programs and kind of see where we're at and um, calibrate going forward. Um, the format of the meeting, uh, Lindsay, uh, who's the prime contractor for the project, uh, will present on the mitigation project and then compile and, um, and other information tables and whatnot. Uh, and then each ACP uh, participant will go over the summary of their annual report. Um, they, there uh, might be other topics of discussion, but we'll stick to the agenda. And um, and if there's any follow-up that we need to do, uh, things that aren't on the agenda, uh, we can do that <clears throat> at a later meeting. Um, but today we should be able to get through all the participants and some of this stuff is gonna be in common and some of it, you know, so as we go along, you know, some of the discussions may be more in depth uh, but apply to multiple uh, participants. And so hopefully, you know, we can work some of that stuff out and then just be able to refer to it as we get to specific, uh, specific uh, participants. Dave, just a question. Are we uh, able to use the chat box? Uh, is that something useful or, or should we just have our comments all on the record? Uh, Linda, what do you think? Yeah, I don't think we're going to be uh, enabling the chat box today. It should all be on the record. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's all sunshine, and I think on these meetings, even chat is sunshine. I don't, I'm not sure, but um, certainly, yeah, everything is um, you know for public review. Okay, so no chat box, uh, and um, so the first uh, item, or I guess item number two, is. Um, a summary and uh, ESRC uh, review of the mitigation site. So uh, Dr. Lindsay Young of Pacific Rim Conservation is the presenter and um, implementer of the uh, mitigation um, program. And so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Lindsay. Okay, thank you everyone for having me here and for selecting our organization and me to help implement the monitoring program as part of this. So I've shared my screen. Um, can you give me a thumbs up or just some sort of indication that you can see what's going on? Okay, so I'm gonna go over um, the entire 2020 activities for the KSHCP. So the Kauai Seabird Habitat Conservation Plan for those that are unfamiliar with it. The format of the presentation is going to be a review of the Kahua Ma'a Seabird Preserve Management a summary of the mitigation effectiveness monitoring at participant facilities, take monitoring effectiveness at participant facilities, compliance monitoring and summary of changes, a financial report, and then the opportunity to go through um, on a participant by participant basis what happened on their properties. So Pacific Rim Conservation, we are a nonprofit group based in Hawaii that functions throughout the Pacific. Um, we specialize in endangered bird conservation and management, sort of the boots on the ground stuff. And our main role in this project has been the implementation of the Kahua Ma'a Seabird Preserve. But as the prime contractor, one of our responsibilities is also compiling all of the work that the participant facilities um, and participants themselves have been doing to mitigate their seabird take. What I'm first going to do is present the work that we have actively been doing on the ground um, over kind of the last six to nine months, then transition into what's been going on at those properties. So if there are questions at any point, um, feel free to stop me and we can go through them at the point that they come up. Okay, so the Kahua Ma'a Seabird Preserve Objectives. Um, these are taken directly from the HCP. So the main thing is the construction of a two hectare predator proof enclosure. So what that means is protecting areas that, are, that don't necessarily have birds in them and removing predators from the inside. This is done through the construction of a predator exclusion fence. These are fences that are high enough that things can't jump over. They have a hood so things can't climb and a fine mesh so that um, mammalian predators such as mice and rats can't squeeze through. 
Once that fence enclosure is up, that is followed by the installation of social attraction equipment. So these are speakers powered by solar panels and artificial burrows. So the seabirds that we're working with, Newell Shearwater and Hawaiian Petrel, I should have backed up and said that those are sort of the um, recipients of all of this, are social creatures. They are attracted to conspecifics and the more that you sort of trick them into thinking there are a whole bunch of other birds there, the more you're going to get in. So the idea is to protect an area and start to draw birds into this area that is now safe for them to nest. Once the predator um, enclosure is built, predators will be eradicated from within. And then once they are eradicated, you want to monitor for incursions. So to make sure that not only is it predator free, but it remains predator free for the life of the fence. On top of that, there's gonna be barn owl control around the preserve and in the surrounding Kalalau Valley area. So you can sort of see just a peak of Kalalau um, right at the top of the screen here. And barn owls are one of the few um, predator threats that we can't physically exclude from a seabird nesting area. And so control of them is gonna have to be ongoing. The sixth item is feral cat control at ingress points into the seabird attraction site. That's what SAS stands for and neighboring source colonies in the Kalalau Valley. So recognizing that you might be creating um, a new predator-free area and a new breeding colony, but that predation is still happening on the colonies themselves where these birds are being drawn in from. And then invasive plant control and vegetation control within the predator-proof fence, PPF stands for predator-proof enclosure, and along a 50 meter buffer outside of the fence. And then finally, and this is the outcome we all hope for, monitoring of those seabirds in their burrows and artificial nest boxes within the reserve, and then monitoring of other listed species that may be in the reserve itself. So those are the objectives as outlined in the HCP. So the timeline of all of these activities is presented here. So the HCP went into effect in um, about mid-2020. So on the top, we have infrastructure installation, fence construction, sound system installation, and burrow. So basically putting all the physical infrastructure in. Um, and that sort of started earlier this year. So it didn't start in the 2020 time period. We were sort of um, staging everything, getting it ready, but installation is well underway, as you will see in just a minute. In terms of restoration, so weeding and outplanting, not quite there yet, but we did do some pretty intensive botanical surveys, which I'll talk about in a minute and then predator control. So we're not trapping anything inside the fence because the fence is not built yet, um, but we have initiated control outside the fence and that will be ongoing through the life of the project. Um, same thing with barn owl control. It was not initiated in 2020, which I'll talk about later, but is starting now that the seabird breeding season is going on. But we did start acoustic monitoring um, as well as monitoring for other species within the fence. So you can kind of see that there's this flurry of activity going on right now in early 21, um, 2021 associated with the implementation of all of the large infrastructure projects. And then a lot of it goes on to either quarterly or intermittent monitoring. Okay, so the first thing that happened right after we signed the HCP ink was fairly dry on this thing. Um, we went for the final site visit of the site that had been chosen um, as the initial alignment that was published in the HCP. And when we went to that site, there had been a very large landslide that had occurred that essentially rendered the initial site um, unusable moving forward. And so you can see the area where the slide occurred had a 55 degree slope, um, which is technically extremely challenging to build a fence on anyway, um, but it rendered it impossible. And you can see sort of the extent of the slide with the human for scale there. It was about 30 meters wide on about 200 meters long and the ground continued to remain unstable. So essentially our first um, act as a prime contractor was a changed circumstance um, with respect to the fence site. So what we did um, was looked nearby. So there was sort of a flatter area that still had some slope, but not nearly as extreme as that, about 200 yards away. And so we went to assess that to see if that could possibly be a suitable location. And what you can see here, um, this is an aerial view. These, this is a luve in this area. This is a preferred nesting habitat. You can see there's still good slope here um, and still into the Kalalau Valley area. So still in sort of the peak um, seabird transit area that we hope to attract birds from. And also still within the Kahuama'a Flats, which was important because that was the area that was described that was proposed. So it was about 200 yards away and still in the area. So when we compare what it looks like, 
The green over here on the right is the original seabird area that was proposed. The landslide was kind of, um, sorry, I'm seeing my zoom and grid view. I'm kind of, the landslide was in this general area of the fence, so kind of on the steepest part. The new area, which is just a little bit west, um, you can see is larger. There are some major differences though. So the area, um, the sort of triangle is already fenced with an ungulate protects a lot of rare plants. And this general area right here bounded in this triangle is relatively flat. And we know that seabirds prefer to have a slope from which to take off from. So we thought if we expanded that existing fence footprint and brought it down the slope a little bit, essentially this corridor right here would be the preferred seabird habitat and also avoided where most of the rare plants were. So a lot of the planting and plants that were being protected were in this general triangle. So a fence could be constructed that protected both seabirds and plants that still had segregated areas for the two of them so that management could occur without disturbing either one. So if we look at this from a comparison perspective, um, the original site where the landslide was was 640 meters. The new site is larger, so it's 873 meters, um, resulting in essentially a doubling in size. When we look at the habitat composition, um, it's a greater percentage of native habitat in the new site, which is a benefit. So there's less restoration that has to go on. It's more intact um, from a bird perspective. The area of suitable seabird habitat, you notice is comparable. So even though this new site is double in size, it has about the same amount of seabird habitat. I'm just gonna go back a little bit. And that's because this light green that you see here, these Oluhe slope areas, that's what we're counting as good seabird habitat. So we did an analysis of minimum slope requirements, um, of you know, plant composition and all of that from known nesting areas that occur today to determine that this area kind of bounded in red is really where we expect the birds to go. So recognizing that not this, this entire area is not necessarily what we would call suitable seabird habitat based on what we know of, but that there was a comparable sized area that did have it. Okay, so the steepest slope angle, that was actually pretty important because when we were doing this walkthrough, when we discovered the landslide, we had two fencers um, with us on that. And they more or less said like, sure, we can build a fence anywhere you want to build it. It doesn't mean you should build it there though, because you will have continual maintenance. The fence might fall off into the valley, et cetera. So the steepest slope angle that we're dealing with at the new site is 35 degrees, which is still a considerable slope, but not in the 55 degree range. And the area of site on a minimal slope um, is much different. So this actually translated into a much, much lower cost. So even though the fence itself is longer and larger, you can see that the cost per meter actually went down dramatically because of the ease of being able to build there. So even though it's larger and not all that area is gonna be suitable seabird habitat, it actually was a cost savings in the long run. So that's a comparison of the changed circumstances that resulted in the new fence alignment that I'm gonna be talking about. Okay, so once we had that squared away, um, our next goal was to start the biological monitoring. And so we did this in several ways. We set up a grid system um, within the fence itself, as well as outside the fence, recognizing that not all of the target species always stay within the fenced area. And we did forest bird surveys at the station points that you see here, so stations one through eight, following um, the variable circular, circular plot method that is standardized and used in forest bird surveys. And then we did seabird surveys, both in terms of the standardized acoustic surveys used by the Koi Endangered Seabird Recovery Project, as well as active burrow searching. So within the entire seabird corridor, which is kind of this eastern edge of the triangle here, um, we did surveys every 10 meters out all the way looking for burrows. So looking for signs of active seabird nesting as well as listening. So in terms of seabirds, none were found in the area. So currently it is seabird free. For forest bird and pueo surveys, um, we found all non-listed forest birds, all non-listed native forest birds you'd expect in that area. So elapayo, apapane, amakihi, there's actually several elapayo nests in this area, um, as well as one pueo that was seen. So we know that we've got a diverse forest bird assemblage there. Um, there are no listed forest birds that we have detected, but there is the possibility that they are there at least on a seasonal basis because of the elevation. So these surveys are repeated formally quarterly by our staff, 
but you know, informally they're there every day. They know what all these birds sound like and if they hear them, they're noting them. So it's kind of an ongoing thing. So the rare plant surveys that were done because this area was initially fenced, this blue is the existing ungulate fence that is there. Um, this was fenced for rare plants and there are several hundred of them in there as well as pet plants. So sort of the rarest of the rare. So DLNR did all of the surveys for those um, and every single plant within the enclosure is flagged. And so what happened, and Linda was really instrumental in this, is we sort of demarcated a seabird area and a plant area. And that line roughly goes where I showed you where the suitable seabird habitat is. And so there's a distinct boundary where we know that if we need to cross into that area, we need to consult with the state so that we're not disturbing the plants and then vice versa. And so our staff have been working almost daily with them. The folks that do the plant monitoring are up there several days a week um, and have a great working relationship. So everyone is aware of where all of the rare species are, what's to be avoided, and the protocol if we encounter something um, in the area that we're working in. So overall, the plant survey, um, there are, again, a lot of listed plants. I haven't put them in there because of data sensitivity issues, um, but we know that they're there, they're marked, and they're being avoided so that they're not negatively impacted. Um, but that being said, within the seabird area that was designated and flagged in consultation with DLNR, there are no rare or listed plants in that area. Okay, so social attraction. Um, these are the artificial burrows on the left-hand side. This is what it looks like when they're above ground. So they're buried up to the point of where you see sort of the paint on the box and then the rest of this is underground. And there's then a tube attached to this opening that comes above ground. So to date, we've built all of the boxes. There are a hundred of them and they are staged and ready to go once the fence is complete. So the infrastructure has been ordered um, and ready to go and is at the site. This is a picture of what the social attraction unit looks like. So there is essentially an inverter and an MP3 player contained in a Pelican case, powered by a solar panel that feeds into a 12 volt battery. And then there are speakers that broadcast the calls um, out towards the area where you expect the birds to be coming in from. So the calls are played from sunset to sunrise and they're meant to mimic sort of a, a loud cacophony of seabird colony calls. Okay, so fence construction. As I said before, this didn't start until 2021, um, but wanted you to rest assured that it is happening and is underway. So I was at the site on Sunday and Monday of this week, and they are maybe about 20% of the way through. And so what's happening, because you can see there's an ungulate fence here that exists, um, we're doing this in such a way so that the fence is never open. There's not any opportunity for pigs or anything to get in while we're doing this, which makes it a little bit trickier. Um, so what it means is they start building and then they unravel a section of hog wire, which you can kind of see here, and that's their, their build for the day. It's essentially join up to the existing panel um, of the hog wire fence. The overall construction is going well. Um, as is probably not surprising, there are delays associated with the weather just because it has been incredibly wet this winter. So they are doing the best they can, um, but it is going. And then what we completed actually Sunday and Monday, the reason why we're up there and we just missed flooding thankfully, is we had the archeologist, the contract archeologist come over and monitor the fence post digging in the area of fence that was not replacing an existing fence, i.e. where there was new digging happening. So she did, um, and this is Dr. Janet Six. Um, she used to do consulting and at the time that we hired her to do this, that was her primary deal. She is actually the county archaeologist for Maui County now. So she is in an official capacity but was doing this as one of her last consulting gigs. So she has decades of experience doing this. So what we had them do on Sunday and Monday is dig through the post holes that are going along the new section of fence that was not replacing an existing one and no features were found. And so we basically went through and drilled all of these and thankfully nothing was there. So we completed the archeological component. And then predator control. So that is it for the infrastructure. Um, it's well underway. It's expected to be complete in the next few months. And what has been happening since about October is trapping. So project staff have set up 32 trapping stations about hundred meters apart that are run for 10 nights a month. So anywhere from 300 to 320 trap nights per month. 
Um, there are 12 along the southern end of the Alakai Swamp Trail that you can see here, and 20 on the side of Kalalau Rim, spaced approximately 100 meters apart. So for the Alakai Swamp Trail and for a portion of those Kalalau rim traps, they are paired with remotely accessible transmitting cameras. So we're able to see at any given time what's going on with the trap. And that is not only to make sure that we know when there's an animal in there, but to also uh, deter against vandalism. So if things do get vandalized, we know right away um, that we need to go address it. So we have had a little bit of theft, a little bit of vandalism, been relatively low. Um, and so far, I've tracked three cats and 39 rats. So cat presence is very low. The cameras also monitor for animals that may have passed by and not gone into the trap. And so far, we've only detected one cat that has not been subsequently removed by the trap. So there is not a lot of cat activity in that area. Um, the alignment that was chosen for trapping was done in consultation with DLNR as well as another contractor that does a lot of their cat trapping in the area. And it was meant to fill in gaps where trapping was not happening, um, but that it would still benefit seabird colonies. So there's a lot of thought that actually went into the location of this trap line and how best to benefit seabird colonies in the area. As I alluded to earlier, barn owl control, we did not start that in 2020, primarily because the seabird season um, was no longer, by the time we started predator control, there were no longer seabirds breeding. Um, barn owl control will begin this month. And initially what was covered or what was um, proposed of the HCP was four nights of barn owl control per month. We would actually like to propose one to two nights per month under this. And part of that is because there's already existing barn owl control happening in that area that we found out about. And so we would like to, it's still being done, um, but I'd like to scale back and supplement that with different areas. And so that might be a topic of conversation to have a little later. We don't necessarily wanna just duplicate effort that's already going on in the same area, especially when the removal rates and the refill rates, i.e. the number of animals that come back into a territory after being removed, are relatively low in that area. So barn owl control is starting, um, but just not quite yet. Okay, so these were the biological objectives laid out in the HCP for the Kahua Ma'a Seabird Preserve. So the first was construct the predator fence and install social attraction equipment within year one of KSHCP implementation. And we are on track to complete this. So I think year one would be by June, 2021. And we're expecting to have this done by June, 2021. So started and underway. Removing predators from within the fenced enclosure um, for the life of the project. Again, we can't remove the predators quite yet because the fence isn't in there. So that's an underway. Ground activity by covered seabirds in the mitigation site by year four. So we're not at year four, that is not yet complete. We've not started social attraction. Same thing with item 2D. So breeding activity covered by the mitigation site, we're not there yet. So same thing with 2E and 2F, those are still longer term objectives. So we're not quite there. In terms of maintaining high quality habitat, item 2G, we're well underway. So as I said before, the new site that was selected is 95% native species, which is fantastic. So we really have a much stronger baseline from which to work in terms of restoration. And if anything, what we're doing is utilizing some of the cleared areas um, that they're having to clear for fencing to make corridors for access for the birds because there is a lot of dense vegetation and we're using that to create flyways. Um, and then making sure the ground you know, the ground cover that comes up is native. So item 2H, protecting nesting birds in the mitigation fence and nearby source colonies, um, that is well underway. The cat control program is completely functional and in an impl implementation mode and barn owl control is not far behind. And so annual protection of any honu nest at facilities by shielding or other lights. Um, we'll talk about that when we get into individual um, participant group reports because we're not doing the direct whole new monitoring. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for a minute because I'm now gonna transition over into the mitigation and monitoring and take compliance of participant facilities. And this might be a good spot to potentially pause and answer questions on anything that's going on at the Seabird Preserve. Hey, Lindsay, this is Melissa. I had one question. Oh. Yes. Um, are the, do the seabirds, so you mentioned that there's the area with the rare plants and that um, obviously seabirds can be pretty hard on plants. Um, how do the seabirds know where they're supposed to nest? 
Just ask a dumb question. <laughs> yes. So how do we know where seabirds are supposed to nest? So one of the nice things about these guys is when you're doing social attraction, they're really highly attracted to the sound itself. And so using those social attraction units and placing them strategically is going to be key. And so this is going to be our placement right here, which is as far away from the plants as we can possibly get. The burrow installation is going to be sort of in a row all along here where that third, um, where that eastern fence panel is going to be removed and it's already disturbed. And so we sort of have some natural features to work with to keep them out of the step over here. The other thing is that there is a sort of um, low point in the ground right in the middle where it tends to get a little muddy in here. And that's not really attractive to them because occasionally there is standing water and heavy rain. So I think com combining placement of the speakers right here and then also broadcast best into the valley and the flyways is how we're gonna accomplish that. But we do recognize and we have talked to the state about what happens if seabirds, you know, quote unquote, invade this area. And I think that there are things we can do. We can put in nest boxes. If they're trying to dig a burrow, we give them a nest box. So that will diminish any damage to any neighboring plants. And we also talked about um, immediately around trees with large root systems because that appears to be an attractive nesting site for them. So if they plant in a more open area, that seems to be something that not, would not necessarily deter seabirds, but it wouldn't be their first choice of where they nest. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is Jim, I've got a question, uh, Lindsay. Uh, you know, thanks. It's, it's a very exciting project. Um, you, you're you're planning on on attracting all three species of seabirds there. Uh, is there any potential problem with uh, competition between them at this site? I mean, we've, you know, there's been similar concerns raised for Makamakaoli. I know between uh, the 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 federal and the Shearwater. Um, is that is that a concern? I don't think so. So these species nest sympatrically and in mixed species colonies naturally up in the mountains, um, and they have pretty different personalities. I mean, Noel shearwaters are a lot more timid, Hawaiian petrels are a lot more aggressive and they have slightly different nesting phenologies. And so I think the combination of that natural experiment is already well underway and they're showing us that they do nest in these mixed species colonies. Um, I, I think that will resolve itself, but if there is any sort of overt aggression that's going on, then we'll take a look at that and maybe consider, you know, broadcasting from different speaker systems for different species, so placing you know, one on this end and one on this end, just to segregate them a little bit. But in short, I don't anticipate that being an issue. We've been doing six years of this at Mihoku at Kilauea Point um, and haven't experienced it there yet. Lindsay, on that point as well, my understanding is that the, the mitigation site itself and the social attraction is predominantly for Newell Shearwater, whereas the predator control outside of the fence is predominantly for the wider array of species. Is that the case? Yes, so the predominant um, social attraction is going to be for Newell Shearwater and that will be the majority of the calls that are being played on the speakers. So it'll be proportional to what is okay. the purpose and intent of the preserve. And for the ESRC members, that's because of the way that the take is anticipated to occur, right? So there's a higher rate of take for Newell Shearwaters than there is for the other species. And so we wanna make sure that the mitigation site is keeping track with that ratio. And this is something that we've struggled with in other areas where seabirds are not all one and the same. And I guess I'm cautious of making sure that if the take is predominantly NASH, that the mitigation site is able to keep track with that and is making up the impact of the take for Newell Shearwaters. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay. Oh, sorry, that quick question. Just can you go to the slide that had the blue polygon? In, uh, that one? Yeah. Uh, I, sorry if I missed it, but what were the pink dots? Oh, these are survey points where we did surveys for plants as well as birds. Um, so that's to try and see what the habitat composition is. And then that will ultimately form the predator eradication grid once the um, once the fence is complete. Okay, and what, what were the blue dots then? These were our forest bird monitoring stations. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, they, they're a further distance apart just based on the distance of the observer. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. 
And Lindsay had a um, question. I'm sorry that you have to move your site. I'm not overly pleased about using the plant area. I have a lot of concerns on that. Um, so maybe if I need to think about it some more and see what the actual impact might be on the <clears throat> future use of that site for plants. So I'll just put that out there that that's disappointing to me, but there could be benefits too, since it's a predator proof fence, which would benefit plants as well. But the reduction in the effective size of the area is concerning to me. So at some point I'll probably want to get with you or somebody else to try to figure out what what actually this this all means but um. I hear your concerns and share them and you know keep in mind the effective seabird nesting area that we are calculating is the absolute minimum based on their known nesting habits now it's not to say these birds didn't nest on flat ground in the past it's only being calculated on what we observe today so we're calculating the minimum. There's possible for seabirds to move throughout this. But overall, I think, you know, this is more of a philosophical issue. I think we need to get away from seeing these fences as protecting only one species and moving more towards an ecosystem approach. And I really think that this site, even though the intent is for the birds, this presents an amazing opportunity to see what the effect of predation is on these listed plants. And so the state botanists are actually excited about this opportunity because it provides a level of protection for critically endangered plants that they would not otherwise receive. So overall, I think it's a net benefit and there's definitely some unknowns. And again, I, I share some of that hesitation with you, but I think given the circumstances that we were in, this is the best opportunity and really presents some unique opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise had. And I can oh. appreciate oh. that, but I, but you know, you did reduce the effective size of this by a fair amount if you're not going to be you know pursuing endangered plant conservation in those areas you're designating as seabird sites as you implied earlier in your talk so some of this, none of this is quote unquote a fatal flaw it's just making sure that you do try to come up with some way to where you can integrate the plant conservation in that area into the whole area not just segregate it and in essence then reduce the size of the of the area for the uh, endangered plant plantings, there will clearly hopefully be a huge impact and beneficial one from excluding the, the rats and uh, mice from the area. And it'll be fascinating to see what that does. So I'm all in favor of that. It's just, you know, it is a quote unquote reduction if there's not a good um, strategy for how you're going to be doing the plants that were, you know, kind of de designated for that area. So that's my, my warning on that particular change. So it could all be a good happy ending. It just, it, it could need to make sure that there's a, a strategy for it. I have some similar concerns. So maybe could I express that before you respond, Lindsay? Um, that my understanding from the fossil record is it's pretty clear that these birds were in uh, areas of low slope in the old days. Um, so I'm, I'm questioning the logic of we're basing this on what we know now. I mean, in the plant conservation world, we also, the, the, those same cliffs where the birds are, some of the same pl places where the last of plants are. And the assumption was, well, they only like the cliff sides, but the reality is that's just the last um, uh, vestige of their habitat that they're, they're clinging onto. And so given the reduction in costs, why don't you guys just make the whole perimeter a predator proof fence and everything benefits and the birds can do what they have evolved to do in these islands? The whole, I, so this whole thing will be a predator fence. Oh, I thought in the previous one, it was only a section of it was gonna be predator proof. No, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. Um, what is that is, red line then? The red line is the minimum calculated seabird area based on that slope consideration. And Kavika, I completely share your feeling of we're only basing this on what we know now. I think it's possible this whole area, seabird area, but I was trying to be very conservative to make sure we were offering something comparable to the other site. But to be clear, this whole yellow line is the predator proof fence. So all of the plants in here will be within the predator exclusion area. Oh, okay. That was not clear to me the first time. Thank you. Yeah, and that's the, that's the real great part about it, right? Mm -hmm. The not so great part is that that area that's um, downslope of the red line how get how that gets used for plants. I mean, 
just to keep in mind the scale that we're talking about here. So this area in red is about 4.1 acres. So Turn Island, for example, is 24 acres. So that is six times the size of this. Turn Island has half a million birds nesting on it. So if we extrapolate that, I mean, in theory, you could fit 75 to 80,000 nesting seabirds in this little area here. I don't think we're gonna be size limited. I mean, that would be my wildest dreams that we get that many birds in there. Um, I think we're being optimistic in terms of, you know, if birds encroach in here, it's not gonna be a huge, huge number. I sincerely hope that it is, but I think it's going to be relatively small, but the number that we can fit in this area um, is enormous. So we're basically not limited by size on this. We're, we're limited by birds. And this, just the final note on this, this will be a work in progress. I mean, we're learning a little bit as we go and as situations arise, I don't doubt that there will be consultation with agencies and botanists to figure out the best path forward. Um, but keeping in mind that this will benefit everything in there and we will try and resolve things as best we can when they come up. Okay, have any more questions on the seabird preserve? Okay, I'm going to skip back through. And then transition into the minimization compliance summary um, and talk about the lighting aspects and what that actually means. And then when we get to individual participant summaries, um, you'll have a better idea. So these are, and thank you again, everyone for the questions. They're appreciated. I like how much thought everyone has put into this. I know this has been a long time coming. And then at the last minute, there was this huge monkey wrench thrown in that required everyone to be flexible in their thinking. Um, and so we're trying to roll the punches as best we can also. Okay, so on to lighting. So these are the guidelines as outlined in the HCP for participants to do at their facility. The main thing being deactivate non-essential lights. Um, for lights that are active, install full cutoff light fixtures, shield light fixtures, and this is what I'm showing here from one of the participant reports, a shielded light, so it's not pointing up skyward. Angle lights downwards, place them under eaves, which sort of act as a natural shielding. Shift lighting according to moon phase. We know that different moon phases have different fallout rates. Um, install motion sensors for motion activated lighting. Decrease the levels, decrease visibility of interior lights. So if you have you know, rooms or cabins or things like that, have curtains. Um, use lightless technologies whenever possible. Plant vegetation around light, lower the height, and use longer light wavelengths. So this is just sort of a, a list of all the different things um, that can be done to decrease lighting. So the next part of the minimization compliance was predator control. So lighting being one, predator control being another, and then sort of education and outreach being the third. So the lighting in particular, um, to go back to this quickly, virtually all of the participants modified their lighting fixtures on their properties to be in compliance with the HCP. And many went above and beyond um, due to essentially things that happened during the COVID pandemic. So there was some silver linings that came out of that that we'll talk about in the individual reports. On the predator control end, um, participants were required for facilities that had lights on to do predator control. And so the way I have put this here, um, we have eight participant groups, many of which have multiple properties. So in the cases where there's multiple properties, you're going to see that here. So there's County of Kauai, Kauai Department of Transportation, Kauai Coffee, Kauai Marriott, Princeville Resort, Alexander and Baldwin, Sheraton Resort and Norwegian Cruise Line. So that's what the abbreviations are for. Um, and then you can see the names of the different properties. So the first question we asked to determine if they're in compliance is whether they conducted predator control. So if they didn't conduct predator control, um, we looked at whether there was a reason for these powerhouse and solar facilities here with A and B, there were no lights on. So it was not required. Same thing with Norwegian Cruise Lines. It's a floating cruise ship, there's no predators on it because it's in the middle of the ocean. So that is an NA, there's no change required, they're not required to do predator control. 
for those that were, were required to do predator control, we then looked at the number of nights. So for the HCP, they're required to do predator control throughout fallout season, which is from um, September 15th through December. So basically you had to do about 100 nights of predator control in order to actually be in compliance with this. And so the number of nights you can see was pretty variable. There are many entities that did the full amount, um, but there are some that only did several nights. And so this was the main area where participants would need to change what they do in 2021 in order to be compliant is meet the minimum number of nights for predator control. And so what I'm presenting right now is a summary overview of everybody. We're gonna get into the details of all of these individual properties later on, but just so you can see where everything happened. So the two other methods we used to determine how it was going it was not just number of nights, but predators per trap night. So in general, if you have a lot of animals on property, you're gonna get a lot of predators per trap night. And you can see that that is indeed what's happening in some of these locations. And that's actually a good thing. That shows that you're removing quite a few animals per unit effort and that it's being effective. And so over time, you expect this to decrease. Um, and this in these numbers are all relatively high. So there's a lot of animals being removed per unit effort, um, and it's much higher than what we see in wild areas where cats are in low density. So this suggests that there's quite a few cats in the areas that are being trapped. And the other site or the other metric we use, and these were just following um, standardized metrics, was the number of traps per acre. So let's say you had like an 80 acre facility and you put one trap out, that's not really sufficient to get coverage for what's going on there. So we use the Pacific Island Invasives Initiative, and they set um, sort of standardized metrics for traps per acre, which is generally you want one trap per 15 acres um, for the animals being targeted. And so the final thing that we suggested were if any changes were needed. And basically the only changes that were being requested was to change the number of trap nights for organizations that did not meet that minimum. So this is the overall summary of predator control. So everyone initiated it. Um, some need to do a little bit more than others to be in compliance. Okay, Jim, I see <laughs> questions. Yeah, no, I've got a, I've got a question. I, I, you know, the, you know, the, the number of uh, traps, the number of trap nights, and so forth. Those are effort metrics. Um, I mean, this, this is being done to reduce the the possibility of, of carcass removal. Uh, it seems like you know that would be sort of the standard we'd be looking for is is having this also matched up with with uh, you know care trials to see. Really what the duration of, of carcasses, carcass retention is on the site. Um, because, you know, again, you know, somebody could be, you know, trapping for, for, for many nights, but they could be using a, a, an inferior bait or something like that, that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really give you. But ultimately, it comes down to how long do carcasses remain to be able to be found. Right. Yes, and I think um, you're correct. There are many metrics you can use to measure predator control efficacy, and I think that that's an important um, discussion to have. This was the only thing that I could take out based on the information that was provided mm -hmm. in the reports, but I do think there's a lot of room to look at removal rates, to look at efficacy of certain baits, all of that. Um, this was just the first pass of, is there another metric we can use to evaluate efficacy that's not just whether or not they met the minimum number of trap nights? Right, right. I mean, and say, you know, with, with, with other projects like the wind farms and so forth, I mean, we use the carcass removal trials and, you know, that's a key thing because that gives you actually something that gets plugged into it to, to the, the, the take formula, um, which is a different kind of a calculation in this case here. But, uh, you know, ultimately that's, that's really what the, the, the variable is that we really are interested in is how long can carcasses remain so that they can be found. Yeah, and, and you know the interesting thing to note, and I'll get to it in a minute, is that all of the take this year, all the birds were alive. So in this case, we want to keep them alive. It's not just how long the carcass is there, but right. in this case, they're actually able to be recovered. And I think that's super important. Yeah, and that, that's assuming the ones that, that you didn't find uh, didn't, didn't get taken by a predator. Right. A couple of points on that one, Jim. So we, the agencies have been talking about this a little bit too, because we obviously have concerns about just effort monitoring versus efficacy monitoring. We have been working on some recommendations to all the applicants on, on what that might look like for this for the 2021 fallout season. And I think because we approved this HCP so close to the seabird fallout season in 2020, we knew that they weren't gonna be able to do everything in, in the 2020 season. But 
our intent is to work with the applicants over this coming spring to try and get us geared up so that they can fully implement predator control plans for the 2021 fallout season. And they do have to submit their updated predator control site specific predator control plans. I don't think we have a timeline for that, but probably late spring, early summer so that they can fully implement those before September. My hope is that some of that will get addressed in that review process. Um, I also think that trying to do the searcher efficiency trials will help us get at whether or not birds are sticking around long enough, even though they're not necessarily specifically carcass retention trials. Right. Yeah. Well, as I, said, I would like to see the carcass retention, you know, as being part of the, the discussion and, and, and implementation. Okay, well, for predator control, this is what I have. Um, and I think a total of 207 animals were removed at participant facilities during that three month period. So, yeah. well, number. just one other comment too is, 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 is in reading the individual reports, I mean, it's noted in, in, in a number of places that there are, you know, there's cat feeding going on and, and you know, either in the site or adjacent to the site and so forth. And so, um, you know, you, you don't have sort of a closed system that you're just removing the predators from. It's, it's you know, constantly being refurbished in, in, in many of those areas. So that's a real concern in terms of how to really interpret the, you know, predators for trap night and, and you know, what, what, how, how effective, uh, you know, the strategy is. So it's just something to keep in mind, that, you know, which gets back to that whole point in terms of what are we really trying to measure. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And I know several of the participants will touch on that in terms of the challenges that they faced in implementing some of their stuff. I know that the... Um, yeah, the trespassing issue was a major one. Okay, any more questions on the overall summary of predator control? This may not be something you can answer, I'm not sure, um, but the ones that are not doing predator control, do we know why they're not doing predator control? The lights are completely off at the facility. So they're essentially not required to when all of the lights are off because there should in theory be no attraction of birds to the facility. So these are remote, um, mainly on the A and B end, you know, powerhouse and irrigation and pump houses where there should be no attraction if lights are off. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the third part of the minimization is training and outreach. So all of the participants were required to train staff and workers, as well as guests in the case of tourism-based facilities um, on the monitoring and response of down sea birds. And because most of the tourism-based facilities obviously had low to zero occupancy because of the pandemic, that component did not occur, but training of all staff did. So in total, 206, or sorry, 2,068 workers and staff associated with those facilities were directly trained on the biology of these seabirds. You can see an example slide here, as well as monitoring and response. Um, and the cool thing about this, when you look at the population of koi, that represents 2.8% of the population of koi in 2019. So even though these are just the workers associated with these facilities, it's actually a relatively high percent um, of the overall population. So that kind of personally made me happy. And you know, in reviewing the materials that the participants presented, they were all great. The participants should really be commended for the amount of effort that was put into staff training as well as the quality of the materials. So that was it for the training component. And then the next is the take monitoring effectiveness. And so this is again a table taken out of the HCP guidelines that monitors the or that outlines the component that's required and what guideline it fulfills. So basically in the reports are required to produce a detailed map of the property, indicating structures and property features um, and the search area. So providing a search route, which the vast majority of the participants did to show where they're walking, how they're conducting their searches, a description of the annual training. Most of them provided the actual PowerPoints or physical materials that I just talked about, the time of year, frequency and time of day of searches, so, and this is kind of the most important one really, it has to occur during seabird fallout season, which is September 15th to December 15th, and a minimum of twice nightly. So basically first thing in the morning um, and then right after sunrise are the ideal times. 
and then search methods. So whether it's a vehicle versus walking versus actively looking, or if this is just part of a security guards like patrol route, how is that actually conducted? Um, the record keeping method. So there's two kind of components to this. One is a downed wildlife form, which everyone has a standardized form they're required to use to report anything they find. Um, and then another is essentially a search log of whether or not they did the search and where they went. And then the presence of any seabirds on site, or sorry, predators on site. So dogs, cats, mongooses, hopefully not mongoose. Um, and the number of searchers needed to cover the area. So this is what is required for take monitoring. And then I'm gonna present the overall report for how they did. And just note, we sort of touched on this earlier, but searcher efficacy trials will be done in year two. So this is not part of the year one activities yet. So take monitoring at participant facilities. So I'll go over what's going on here. So we have the owner, which is the participant, the property or facility, the number of birds actually found. So the number of covered species, whether the search routes were provided, whether the training documents were provided, the search dates that they, or the time of year they did the searches, the search times, whether they documented the methods, whether they submitted a take log, if predators were recorded on site or changes needed. So essentially trying to summarize that table for each participant group. So the first column, what you can see is that very few birds were found. There were four total, um, one at the Port Allen Commercial Facility, two at Lihui Airport, and one at Port Allen owned by Hawaii Department of Transportation. All four were dual shear waters, all four were found alive and either turned into SOS or released alive, which I'll talk about in a minute. So very little in terms of take. Um, Sheraton Kauai Resort had one honu nest that was reported and then I received emails about fledglings, or not fledglings, sorry, um, baby turtles on the property. So those were not reported in the report. Uh, Sheraton will probably talk about what was going on there, but we did have some honu that were reported. Okay, so search routes provided. Um, the vast majority, yes, everyone provided their documentation for where they're walking, what they're looking at, and everyone provided, or almost everyone provided their training documents. The search dates, um, virtually everyone was in during the secret season. You'll notice that for these remote facilities, um, only on nights when the facility was lighted. And so this kind of gets back to whether or not predator control is conducted at these facilities. If the lights were off, predator control and searching was not happening. And so predator, sorry, searching did not occur at these sites. So search times, um, some properties actually did continuous because they had 24 hour security presence. So just whenever security would do their rounds, they would search. Most of them did the standardized search times of three hours before sunset and then one hour after sun or before sunrise. Um, the only difference is County of Kauai was only required to do a once daily search. So they opted to do that in the morning hours. They did not do the evening search. And then methods documented, um, almost everyone documented all of their methods as you can see here. And for those that had take on their property and NA means they did not have any take on their property, they did submit their take logs. Um, and then finally, whether predators are recorded on site, that's a yes for everybody, except for Norwegian cruise lines because they are floating in the ocean. So changes needed um, were whether they were out of compliance with any of these things. So this one, um, Port Allen Solar Facility is no longer a covered facility because it was sold. So it just needs to be removed for 2021. And then the main change um, is we needed more information on the Honu Nest at the Sheraton. But overall, everyone was in compliance from what we could tell at the annual report for their take monitoring. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a minute. I'm sure there are questions here. Is the new owner of the Port Allen facility going to be a participant? I don't know the answer to that. That's probably an A and B question. Um, I, I guess I can answer that. Um, uh, they've given no indication that they wish to participate. Um, and uh, that facility is, is uh, generally dark. Uh, so I suspect they won't see an incentive to, to participate due to the fact that the lights are, aren't, aren't turned on at night. Great, thank you. Okay, 
Okay, if there are no other questions, I'll move on just to the summary of the four birds that were taken. Um, so as I said before, these were all Newell Shearwaters, um, two at Lihui Airport, one at Port Allen Marina Center, and one at Port Allen Harbor. Um, one of them flew off on site, so that's a good sign. It was able to take off as, of its own accord. The rest were turned into SOS. And you can see these all happened within um, a five-day period or an eight-day period of each other. So all that second week in October um, morning, except for the Lihui Airport birds. So that's consistent with Newell's biology. We normally see them leaving everything first thing in the morning, and that's when they're most active. So that's the information on the four birds that did come down. Okay, and then on to just a reminder of the total permitted seabird take that was in the participants' PIPs, their participant inclusion plan over the 30-year period. So as part of the compliance monitoring, one of the items that was stated in the HCP was whether the report was turned in on time, and almost everyone got their report in on time. There were a couple that were late by a few days, but not the end of the world. Um, this is the lethal and non-lethal take for NASH, Newell Shearwater. Um, for each participant. For Hawaiian petrel, again, the lethal and non-lethal take, and Bandrump storm petrel, the lethal and non-lethal take. Um, and so just a quick note on the four-letter abbreviations that we're using. These follow um, the USGS Bird Banding Lab four-letter abbreviation. There was some confusion because Bandrump storm petrel, previous abbreviations had been BRSP, um, but the definition that is widely used is BAN. So in case you're wondering what that stands for, um, we're following what's used by the bird family. Okay, and then calculated seabird take for all participants in 2020. So recognizing that not all birds are seen um, that are taken, each participant submitted their calculation of what their take was for seabirds in this year. So you can see um, what everyone has put in. So the maximum anticipated total fledgling annual take is 30 for NASH non-lethal 45 and across the board. And so far the cumulative fledgling take since May 2020 is 2.79, which is the same as the total 2020 take. So in future years, this row right here is oops, going to increase as we get more. Um, but right now it just represents the 2020 total because we're in year one. Okay, are there any questions on this? Yeah, sorry, I'm really confused. I thought in the previous slide the take was in the hundreds. How to go down to 30? This is total cumulative over the life of the 30 year project. And then this is total annual maximum. How many years is the project going again? 30. So if our annual maximum is 30 birds and it's a 30 year project, the total is about 900. Okay. So a couple of things from the Fish and Wildlife Service side, um, it seems like across the island take, light attraction take was down this year. We think that that's probably due to COVID and more people having lights off in the evening hours. We don't know exactly, but that seems like a reasonable assumption. Obviously, we'll learn more over the next couple of years. Um, secondly, we are looking at a couple of incidents of downed birds that occurred off of the applicant's properties or that were found off of the applicant's properties, but that may have been, we're not sure yet. I'm hesitant to say anything, but there's certainly been a couple of downed birds that were found nearby lights, but that are not necessarily found by applicants. So we need to try and figure out what to do with those birds. Yes, and that's something, actually that's a good point that's outlined in the annual report, but that I didn't put in the presentation. I believe there were three additional downed birds, one of which was dead. Um, that were found during part of these searches and where search logs were submitted, but they were not on the participant property. They were found during part of that search process. So that is what Michelle is referring to and is outlined in a little bit more detail in the annual report. Thank you, Lindsay. I think there's a pretty strong correlation too between people being out and about, like human activity and finding the birds. And so Sure, there may have been lights off, but I think there probably was also less discovery this year because there were less people walking around in dark corners. 
that could stumble across where, them where they had gotten tucked away in a corner. So I, I don't know do you, if you have thoughts on there being less take due to lower lights versus less chance of discovery because there were just less people out and about to discover them. I think it's probably a combination of both, to be honest. Um, yeah, it, it's really hard to say what it is because there's significantly more effort on, in theory, in the participant facilities going on to discovering these birds, but there was clearly other stuff going on in this year that makes it abnormal. So can you, Lindsay, can you just review uh, quickly? It's, I know it was in the original uh, document, but uh, uh, in terms of how the how what the how the how the how the calculated take is calculated, uh, particularly in terms of you know the assumption in terms of what percentage of birds are not found. I think that is dependent. I'm going to preface this which, with I don't know a ton about how those calculations are done and arrived at, but I know that each participant, it's based on, gosh, I'm not sure what the actual term is, not searcher, maybe it is searcher efficacy, but it is variable for each participant. And these are provided to me by the participants themselves. So I'm not the one calculating the numbers. So I think what might be give you a clear answer is to ask the actual participant themselves how they came up with that calculation. I guess I'm confused. I thought there would be a consistent way that that was, was calculated. And, and so it's not just up to the participant to come up with the formula. Maybe I'm not, not understanding it completely. I don't know that I fully understand it either, to be honest, Jim. Uh, I, that's a key point <laughs> because it, it really leads to what your total take is. And the agencies are reviewing each calculation for each applicant. Does the service and, and, and the state understand their calculation methods for each one or, and why are they different? I think it's probably better if we talk when the each applicant is chatting with us. But it, I'll, I would get Kate or Jenny to try and talk more directly about the different criteria, but some of this is searchable area, right? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, because I remember, you know, very clearly, uh, you know, several meetings, many meetings back, uh, Andre Rain, Rain and, and some of his crew gave a presentation and they talked about how really difficult it was to find birds and you had to really know what you're doing to find them uh, as they got tucked away and so forth. Um, and so, you know, it comes up to the question in terms of, you know, again, what, what, what percentage of birds that may have come down, you know, would, were not found ever. And that's it. It's a key part to the to the calculation of take. I, I my understanding is that it's a standardized process, but it's different for each applicant based on their site specific characteristics. So it is. Remember last year when we were reviewing each applicant's PIP and we were talking about their discovery rate, and there's a default level of fifty percent discovery rate if they do certain things, but then some people proposed a higher level of discovery rate based on them doing additional actions. Do you remember that conversation? So each, each applicant has, a, has an approved discovery rate. Many of them are 50%, but some of them are higher. Yeah, no, I remember that discussion and, and, and I, I guess I did some head scratching on that one too. I mean, ultimately I, I would really like to see some QAQC on that and you know, through, through uh, you know, occasional you know, spot checks and things like that, just, just to verify where we stand on it. And it may be higher, maybe lower because of that. Agreed. And I, I mean, that's, I think, why we asked for the discovery rate to be verified through the DOFA searcher efficiency trials that would happen in year two. Great. I'm looking forward to that. Ginny or Kate, anything you want to add on that topic? Um, just that Kate, Kate and I um, had discussed that there were difficulties in implementing the DOFA compliance monitoring this year due to COVID travel restrictions. And so um, Kate is following up on that and looking into um, ways to do that for this upcoming year. I don't know if Kate, you wanna add anything to that. 
Um, yeah, that's correct. We're we're talking to various vendors and getting some quotes and also just brainstorming on what would work in the different facilities because there's so much variability there. Um, and we will be meeting with each other more, but we're at this point, we're still seeking quotes. We don't really know what our options are. We're still trying to figure out what the best strategy is. Okay, no, I, I appreciate your, you know, the, the challenges we've had this, this past year. Um, but, but again, I do, I do feel, you know, you know, from, from, you know, sitting on the SRC that this is an important component to it and, and look forward to seeing that, that really develop. Okay, so are we, any more questions on calculated seabird take? Lindsay, sorry, can you go back to the um, total slide, please? This one? Yeah, um, no, no, that one, yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot more out uh, within Hua'u. Yes. So, does that match with your does that proportionality match with your understanding of the population on the island? I don't know the answer to that because I'm not quite, I don't have a good handle on how many newels are actually on the island. We know their rate of decline, but I think it's really difficult to estimate their population size. Um, I do think that they are more attracted to light than Hawaiian petrels are. So there's two components to that. It's not just population, it's species biology. And that's something, um, it's a side note, but there's a graduate student at UH that's doing a lot of work with the eye morphology and physiology of both of these species. It's presented some excellent talks on that. And there is evidence that newels are possibly more attracted to light than Hawaiian petrels based on their, their physiology. So I think it's a combination of things. And there is some good, evidence out there about the flight times of newels versus the flight times of Hawaiian petrels and how the flight times of newels is more interactive with nighttime lighting than Hawaiian petrels are. And yes, Hannah Moon's work is incredible. If you haven't looked at it or heard some of her presentations before, she's the graduate student, or is she a postdoc student? I can't recall, that's doing the eye morphology. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Okay, so last two slides before I hand this over to participants. And these are basically the financials. So this is the operating account financial report um, that shows each participant's amount that they put in and the date that the funds were deposited. Project disbursements so far in 2020, and most of that cost, 359,000 is related to capital expenses associated with the fence. So total expenses in 2020, um, 366,324 and two cents. So this is the report that is provided by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which is the fund holder for this. So this is the operating account, operating account. And then the next is the reserve account financial report. Um, so basically nothing has been spent with the exception of the management fee for the account. And this is just the reserve that's being held. And same thing, same format as the other report goes by um, participant and then the amount and date funds were deposited. So any questions on finances? A question. Um, Right now, Pacific Rim is the contractor. Is that for the duration of the, the, the take license and, and the permit? No, we are contracted for the first five years of the project. And that was something that we specifically asked for so that there was an evaluation period to determine if the participants were happy with us and if we felt that we had the capacity to continue. So we have a five-year contract um, that goes through 2024. And then at that point, it will be reevaluated. And who, who does the evaluation in terms of, you know, the transfer if, if, if say, another vendor is, is, is chosen? I mean, is that a thing that the, the agencies are going to be consulted on, or is it just to, uh, how does that work? I, I'm, I'm the, my, the, you know, the foundation of my question is, is making sure that there's consistency in terms of the program, at least in terms of credibility. I don't know the answer to that question. 
I mean, it seems like that would be something the agencies would be figuring out. Is that correct, Fish and Wildlife and State? Sorry, Jim, I'm looking, I was about to text Jenny and find out if we knew. Jenny, can you answer that? I can't, I'm sorry right now. I'm trying to look and see. We would imagine that there would be coordination with the agencies to ensure that there is consistency in the results of the mitigation project. Um, if there is inconsistencies, if, if there are differences and the success of the program is not as um, what it, PRC is accomplishing, then we would definitely have to discuss that and figure out solutions to make sure that the offset is meeting what is anticipated. Well, both, both from the standpoint of the agencies as well as from the ESRC, it would be really good if it's not just a uh, year, the end, the year has ended, we're on a new year and hey, there's somebody else who's new who's, who's doing the contract. I mean, it would be good. It would be very important to have some sort of a transition there just in case there is some concerns that might come up. Uh, so I, I, would, I would really you know, like to see some of that discussion and planning happening basically in the last year of that five-year contract. Jim, I, I think that there's language related to that in the HCP, but I can't find it fast enough. I will go back and look at that. And if we don't have that lined out in the HCP, we'll make sure that we talk to the applicants about that yeah. related to the year. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, and Jim, you know, because the um, mitigation site is on state land, they would have to consult with us for sure on any uh, agreement that we would have to get an agreement with any new operator. That would be uh, one opening for, um, you know, consulting on what's going on and how it's going to uh, transition. I'm, I'm just trying to think proactively in terms of, uh, you know, that potential transition there. Uh, again, you know, consistency in terms of approach and, and, uh, and you know, in all aspects of the project is, is really a key thing to, to the success of this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and Jim, just to expand on that, that was a clause that we specifically asked for. Um, you know, we're obviously flattered that you wanted us for the whole 30 year project, but it's always good to have an option that if you aren't happy with our performance or if we don't feel we have the capacity to make sure that there's an evaluation period, we can go through that. And so my expectation was in year four, we would sit down together and look at what's working, what's not working and how to move forward. Um, and then, you know, assuming that we stay on, but it also gives the participants the opportunity to select another contractor if they aren't happy with what's going on or if it's just not a good fit for whatever reason. So I think we have plenty of time to figure that out. Jim, I just wanna, sorry, it is in the HCP, I just found it. Um, it's on page 59 of the HCP. And, and the um, if there's a prime contractor other than PRC, then participants shall consult with the agencies regarding selection of an alternate prime contractor. So it's in there. I, and I presume the agencies would come back to the SRC for part of that discussion at least. Absolutely. And you know, for some reason we did hand this over to another organization at the five year point, you know, we would be committed to ensuring a smooth transition and making sure that there was no loss in continuity or anything like that. Yeah, and I guess the other thing too is, is, is ensuring that there's no propriety information. I mean, that the, the data are, are properly transferred so there's there's no no break in, in, in data analysis and so forth. Yes. No, and that's, I mean, probably one of the benefits of us being a nonprofit is we don't really have, the data is for everyone. <laughs> it's for the birds. So we have no issue sending that over. Great, thank you. Okay, well that actually concludes my portion of the presentation. Um, and so I believe COA is going to be transitioning over into the applicant summary report. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just for a moment. And then I believe COA is going to share his screen and go through them um, by each applicant. Can we take a five minute break? Okay. Yep, five minute break. Cohen needs a break to, uh, he's got a glitch with the share screen function anyway, so um, good timing. So uh, it's 10.24 according to my watch. So let's come back at uh, 10. Sound good? Sounds good, thanks. Thank you.
Okay, good up. Looks like we're back online and Koa has gotten his technical glitch fixed. So, thank you very much, Lindsay. Appreciate it. Um, so this is the first year that we've done this. Um, does the committee like the the format on that summary? Is that good? That yeah, that was excellent. I, 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 it, it's a very good way to present it and looking forward to the individual participant discussions now. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. So um, moving on to item three. Um, this is going to be a summary of the Kauai Coffee Annual Report. And um, so let's see. So Kauai Coffee, whoever's up, we can go ahead. Hello, David. Fred Cole here from Kauai Coffee. Good morning, everybody. You able to hear me all right? Is it Yep, good morning. Thank yeah, you. I can hear you well. Thank you. Oh, pardon the product placement. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, everything here is fairly self okay, I'm sorry, David. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the results are, are uh, posted. Um, nice to see the photo of our light on the side of the building used as one of the light uh, controls. Um, that, was presented earlier. Uh, we have been fully modified. Predator control was started late and will be certainly improving as we go in. The training has worked quite well um, and a good learning experience for the first year. I've got nothing else if there's no questions. Okay. A, a question. I mean, do you see any challenges with uh, with with complying with uh, you know the, the the stipulations in the HCP or or things that you see need improvement? Uh, thank you for the question, Jim. No, um, it's it's. I actually see us um, able to comply. Uh, the the plan obviously is changing as we learn. Um, I think in terms of uh, our team's involvement, and I was I was very. Um, encouraged to see the total number across the entire island that are trained. Uh, although we've had SOS and bird awareness for quite a few years, this really changes the, the baseline, certainly from the facilities that are participating. Uh, so no, I don't, Jim, I think it's gonna work. Great, no, I appreciate that. Um, it is an opportunity also to, you know, possibly do some public outreach in terms of the efforts you're doing as, as part of your brand. You bet. Any other questions for Koi Coffee? Just to confirm, you have a 50% mm -hmm. discovery rate, is that correct? Could you repeat the question, Michelle? Sorry, um, Koi Coffee has a 50% discovery rate, is that correct? Yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure, thank you. Yeah, I, I was thinking about the recovery rate as the discussion was going on. In our case, we're not dealing in an area with heavy vegetation. It's parking lots and other types of areas that are more easily searchable. Um, but signing up for 50%, I think gives us a good baseline. Thank you. So sorry, this is loyal. So um, this is, there's no lights on in the fields for harvest? There is some lighting in the field, but only in the particular field that are being harvested. Um, and so we do, we are doing searches in those areas uh, on, a, on a nightly basis in the areas where we're working. And that includes a 50% discovery rate too there? Correct. Thank you. To, to the best of my knowledge, let's put it that way. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Fred, I appreciate it. You're welcome, aloha. Okay, aloha. 
looking forward to working with you going forward. Um, so item four, we'll move on to the Sheraton annual report. Hello, hi, this is Reggie David. Um, so I'm reporting on behalf of this permit holder. Um, the four uh, properties that I will be reporting on today are all visitor industry based. And um, this past year was absolutely brutal for all of them. Uh, COVID basically shut down Kauai. And for many of those folks, uh, people like me that are consultants couldn't even go to the island. So we had a bit of a rocky uh, start to the season for clients or for permanent holders that didn't already have in place a fairly seasoned uh, seabird programs. Um, Lindsay's slide is up there. Um, we had no take of seabirds. We did have a significant issue in folks not understanding who to report the home nests to. They actually did follow the standard guidelines and did contact NOAA and DOFA but for some reason did not figure out that they were also supposed to report this as part of their uh, HCP compliance. So I guess uh, yeah, I opened it to questions. Reggie, you're, um, you're confident that they now understand those requirements and that you're gonna brief them on that again because sea turtle season is is coming up right um, around the corner. Right around the corner. <laughs> so, regardless of whether or not you know people are back in those resorts by then or not, I think it's important that we try and resolve any issues that are still there prior to May. So, yeah, the um, the good news is, um, well, one, the resort was closed. Um, so um, that did add. And we only had 16 employees um, spread over 24 hours. So it made things a little bit difficult. The Kauai is now reopening. So our plan is that very shortly I will be going over to Kauai and I will be sitting down with everybody um, going through the details of their permit, their reporting requirements, and basically make sure that uh, we comply with all the terms and conditions um, that is what we'd have ordinarily done, but um, since this is a private entity and uh, did not qualify for essential worker travel, um, that did not happen in 2020, but it will happen very shortly. And they are completely um, expecting to comply completely with the terms of the, of the permit. Great, thank you, Reggie. I would recommend that the annual report be revised to include the sea turtle incident in there because I noted that it was absent from the write-up. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, thanks. And then, gosh, sorry, I lost my train of thought and I had one. <laughs> um, if, if you need any help on the, sea, on the sea turtle conservation work, please reach out to the agencies in advance because we, we want to make... Remember that the KSHCP does not have a take provision for sea turtles in it. And it's because we made the analysis that with the avoidance and minimization measures that the applicants were going to use that no needed. And I still believe that that is the case if they, if all the applicants are actively ensuring that those avoidance and minimization measures are fully in place. But if they're not fully in place and we continue to have incidents to take, we're going to have to be in a world of potentially amending permits and we don't want to be there. So we want to work with all of the applicants to make sure that those measures are fully in place and that we don't have to do any, any amendments. Um, we completely understand that. And my client is very concerned. So I don't think there's going to be any issue. Um, we will take care of it. We will reach out to the agencies. We did follow the standard protocols with uh, reporting, but they just missed the boat on reporting to the HCP team. And we apologize. Okay. Thanks, Reggie. Appreciate it. Yep. Hey, Rich, this is, Reggie, this is Jim. <clears throat> how, how, how do you, 
it, it seems like it'd be a real challenge when you've got a large number of, 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 of security staff uh, who are doing the searches and so forth. How, how, how are you ensuring consistency between their skills, capabilities, reporting, et cetera? Uh, you know, how, do, how, do we, how do we get that? I mean, obviously, if one person is doing it, that's one thing. But when you have a, a group of different people, do you, do you see problems with inconsistency or are there things that you can do to minimize that besides the kind of training you're doing? Uh, no, I, I um, because for this facility, uh, we actually, uh, once we get a little bit more open, we will have 200 people searching, uh, similar to any other hotel. Um, currently, what we have on the property is that we have standard um, security guard rounds with lock boxes that they have to actually key into. So we do know that they're actually following the route. And um, uh, because I was unable to personally train them, uh, this past season, I will be doing that. And um, most of these folks have been around um, for a long time. They, um, they're they interested in the animals. So I, I don't see any real issue with that at all. And now that we're going to be able to travel to Kauai fairly easily, uh, I'll sort of do my usual uh, training modules and stuff I've done on other properties and other HTPs and bring this one back in line. Okay, no, that's that's great. I, I, I know, you know, w w there is a proviso in there in terms of spot checks, uh, you know, by by agencies and so forth. Um, and, and I think that's a useful thing. I mean, all of us, uh, you know, QAQC is, is, is a help for all of us, no matter what. Um, is that a thing that potentially you would do as a contractor in terms of just internally doing, you know, some sort of QAQC in addition to that? We certainly can look into that. Um, you know, one, there's a couple of issues. Well, um, I'll say the same thing Fred said. Um, this is a, a, a site that is basically fully developed. So it's relatively easily searchable. It's parking lots and a pretty high-end hotel. Um, so it's relatively easy to search. Um, I think, um, you know, once we do the QAQC to make sure that everybody's doing it exactly the same way, we'll be kind of on, on the way to, to moving forward. Um, we are going to have some issues given that we've got um, something like 70 sites here um and if we're going to actually do uh, validation trials uh, we're going to have a problem trying to find enough carcasses to do that so we're going to have to get creative on how we do some of that um but no we i you know i do it at other properties so uh, mm -hmm. i'm certainly more than willing to do it um to me that's kind of the gold standard so yeah Okay, and then then a final question, sort of similar to the one I asked uh, to the you know the previous you know uh, permittees is: Are there any any challenges besides the obvious? I mean you, that you've talked about the challenges for this year, but are, are there any challenges in terms of uh, being able to comply with the the stipulations of the of the HCP uh, or any suggestions for change of things that uh, should be looked at in a different way from your perspective? No, I. Um... I don't see any challenges. I mean, the reality is we do need to jump on it. And we had some major issues this season. Um, I don't see any uh, issues in getting this turned around by next season. Um, obviously, the way that I have always worked is that I will be consulting with the agencies. Um, if there are issues that we just can't figure out or we need to talk about doing it some way differently, but and this is a resort property. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science. And it's rel you know, it's easy to search compared to a seabird colony, the kind of stuff that Lindsay is doing. My goodness. I mean, how you find those birds is it's it's ridiculous. I mean, we're talking lawns, pavement, parking lots. There isn't an awful lot of number of places for birds to go hide. So I don't I don't honestly see any real challenges other than just getting on the ground and and uh doing what i usually do reggie this is loyal um Hello. so it, it says one or two uh sea turtle nests do you is it one or is it two i believe it's one uh what happened is that they did have um dlnr come out um they were unsure um, they did confirm one nest. They visited the site once and never came back. So we're not a hundred percent sure. 
and no one tracked what the outcome of the nesting was? Yeah, the, the one nest did hatch and um, yeah. And well, I, I suspect it was probably just one nest. And ordinarily this beach is one that if the hotel were open, there are two or 300 people a day on the beach. So um, we've seen this across Kauai during COVID is that we've got turtles all over the place in places that nobody's seen them in 40, 50 years. Uh, so it's a pretty amazing. So what actions did the hotel actually take other than just reporting? The uh, we put the, the standard fencing around, put up signs. Um, we didn't have any guests. Um, so, but we, we followed the, the standard protocols that Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA and NIMPS have. But nobody knows how many hatchlings there were. No. And, and we do know that some percentage of the hatchlings that hatched out of that nest were affected by lights and ended up where they should not be. You do one, know that. One, yeah, one, one, one turtle. Yeah, there okay. were um, there were hatchlings found in the pool, um, and I have a report that says um, the DLNR Division of Aquatics, who's responsible for excavating turtle nests and and um, monitoring turtle nests on Kauai, um, were coordinating with the Sheraton, and um, that they uh, were going to go and excavate both turtle holes. So um, it looks like there's two turtle nests. And um, they didn't find anything in the nest chambers. And so um, the outcome from the turtles that were in the pool is that they were released to the ocean. And then the other nest, well, I guess both nests were empty. Thank you, Jenny. As in they, as in they, both, as they both presumably hatched and all the hatchlings made it out. Um, and it was three baby turtles that were found in the it was the hatch, three hatchlings that were found in the pool. I guess this is just a note from, from us to all of the applicants that are beachfront. It would be helpful to summarize the measures that y'all are taking for sea turtles relative to the avoidance and minimization measures that are in the HCP in your annual report, regardless of whether or not there was any nest documented on your property for the year or not, and regardless of whether or not there was any hatching instance. So in that way, it's a little bit easier for all of us to track. Um, certainly, again, our goal is just to try and make sure that those avoidance and minimization measures are adequate to fully avoid take because KSHCP does not, allow, does not have a take provision in it for sea turtles. We'll certainly follow that. It's okay. a very good idea. Yep. Thank you. But there was no deaths reported on any of the turtle hatchlings from any cause. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, it, and so, you know, yeah, and yeah, I guess you'd assume that that was not, didn't rise to the level of a non-lethal take on the hatchlings in the pool. So, yeah. I think we'd prefer to address it through adaptive management at this point. Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll work more closely with Fish and Dofa to ensure that what we put in, in place uh, for next season and what we include in our annual report reflects everything we're talking about today. And, uh, documents the measures that we've taken to ensure that we don't have take of, of turtles. Thank you, Reggie. Okay, thanks, Reg. Uh, anybody else have any questions or comments, input? Okay, thank you, Reg. Appreciate it. Thank you, committee. Um, we'll be moving. Yeah, well, we'll be talking to you soon, I'm sure, here and some other issues or some other <laughs> applicants. Um, so, we'll be moving along now to item five.
uh, summary of uh, AMD annual report. I mean, Sean yep. Yeah, I'm Sean O'Keefe with uh, Alexander and Baldwin. Um, so I'll be reporting on our facilities. Um, we had uh, nine, nine facilities covered by the uh, permits uh, at the start of the year. <clears throat> and that's counting all our Port Allen uh, commercial properties as one facilities or one facility. There's actually multiple parcels at Port Allen that are within the uh, KSHCP. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, uh, the Port Allen solar facility um, it was taken out of our permit uh, when it was sold at the end of September. Uh, so um, yeah, we'll be revising all the uh, various plans and whatnot to uh, reflect that. Um, as far as search effort, um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we, we did not conduct searches at the McBride Resources facilities pump three, Wainiha power plant, and Kalaheo power plant, all of which remained dark throughout the season and are normally dark even off season. Um, our uh, monitoring plan calls for those facilities to be searched um, on any nights when there are, uh, you know, there's an emergency call out or other activities at the facility that requires the lights to be turned on. So, um, in the course of the monitoring, I do uh, verify with the um, facility operator each week whether they had lights on at any time during the week. Um, all the other facilities were searched um, as required throughout the season. On lighting, um, the majority of our facilities um, based on our uh, most recent lighting audits um, were fully compliant um, in terms of their lighting installations. Um, we do still have some uh, uh, progress to be made at the shops at Kukuiula. There was some work done uh, prior to the start of this season to install temporary shielding on some of the walkway lights. Um, we'll of course be uh, submitting, I believe it's in May that it's due uh, a detailed uh, plan and schedule um, and cost estimate for uh, broader lighting improvements at the shops at Kukuiula. Um, also at Port Allen, um, we do have at the Port Allen Marina Center some lights that we uh, plan to address in the off season. Those lights are under covered walkways, sconce lights, um, but we feel they can be uh, tuned up a bit uh, during this off season, or I'm sorry, during the uh, prior to the uh, 2020 season, um, we did implement uh, some minimization measures there by replacing the bulbs with lower intensity LEDs, and then also uh, turning off uh, every other bulb um, on those walkways um, throughout the season. Um, so we're looking at um, basically replacing the fixtures. Um, with something uh, uh, that's even better than what we did during the past off season. Of course, we'll do a, we'll do some uh, uh, preseason audits in the coming year to make sure that there's been no backsliding on the other lighting uh, at, at the various facilities. Um, on predator control, again, uh, at the McBride facilities, predator control um, is only triggered by uh, the lights being turned on. So we, we, are, um, we do have traps at those facilities, um, uh, but we, you know, we don't use them. We don't put them out unless there's gonna be activities that could potentially attract seabirds. Um, there is a typo here. It says uh, that um, uh, predator control was done at six of nine facilities. It's actually five of nine. Um, uh, there, are, there were four McBride facilities at the start of the season. Um, and now there's now there's three with the loss of the uh, uh, solar facility. So five uh, five of the nine facilities had uh, predator control from prior to the season through the end of the season. And um, training and outreach is I think is self-explanatory in terms of take. Um, we did find one downed Newell seawater uh, Newell shearwater at the uh, Port Allen Marina Center. Um, and uh, 
uh, that was a non-lethal turned into SOS. Um, in terms of our calculation of take, um, currently we're following the standard um, guidance in the KSHCP document, uh, which is that um, uh, you know we assume that there's at least one lethal take for every bird we find. Uh, there's a there's a lethal take um, uh, of a bird that we did not find. And then also for any bird that we find that um, is released alive, uh, there's a 12% uh, factor applied to that. Um, again, based on the assumptions in the uh, uh, KSHCP. So that's why our take comes in at 1.12 birds for the year, uh, our lethal take. Um, we are one of the facilities that was mentioned earlier that found birds off-site. Um, and uh, so we actually found during the season, we found a total of four birds, uh, but only one was on our property. And the reason we're finding birds that aren't on our property is because, as I mentioned, there's multiple parcels down there at the harbor that we own. And so our searchers need to, uh, you know, travel between those parcels and so they are they are off site and I commend them for being observant enough when they're not on our property to still be looking for birds and um, in this uh, this past season they, they did find uh, three other birds um, in the general area. Uh, one of those birds was uh, relatively close to our property. Um, the other two I think were clearly you know well off site. Um, uh, challenges, uh, you know, there are many uh, associated with offsite cat colonies, you know, down at the Port Allen uh, area. Um, I'm aware of at least uh, uh, three now offsite colonies that are being maintained. And so obviously, you know, we have that to deal with in terms of, you know, cats uh, uh, coming onto the property. Um, and of course, people come in on, you know, it's not just that uh, the colonies are being maintained offsite. Um, we do have trespassers coming onto our property and feeding cats despite the signage. Um, and in some cases, despite uh, our security personnel or other contractors, you know, directly approaching these people and, uh, you know, explaining to them why we don't want cats being fed on the property. So, um, uh, you know, that all led to actually some close communication with some of the folks involved in those colonies. And I think, uh, uh, you know, in the coming seasons, we'll probably do some outreach directly to them prior to the start of the season. We also had to do some uh, 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 modification to our activities, um, specifically at Port Allen and at uh, Hokule. Um, where we uh, had a contractor come in and for the specific reason of trying to catch the cat feeders and, and uh, try to educate them and get them to stop uh, feeding the cats. So, uh, you know, we never actually caught them in the act, but um, we, did, we did remove their, their cat food when, when there was evidence, uh, you know, found that they had snuck on the property and fed the cats. So that's an activity that we will most likely implement earlier in the season. I don't think we'll do it for the whole season, but the idea would be uh, rather than reacting to it as we did this past year, uh, we start out the season with, uh, you know, some, some uh, strong monitoring of, of uh, trespassers and, uh, you know, try and convey to them the messages that, uh, you know, that we conveyed later in the season this past year. Um, I, I really think those are the main challenges is dealing with the offsite colonies and the onsite uh, on site feeding. Um, but as I mentioned, we do still have some lighting improvements to, uh, uh, to complete. And then uh, changes for 2021. Um, well, the Port Allen Solar Facility, that's actually a 2020 change. Um, and, and so, you know, the Port Allen facility was not in the program for, um, except for about two weeks of the, uh, of the season. Um, for 2021, um, you know, we'll, it remains to be seen what changes may come up. We do still have some undeveloped 
uh, areas uh, at Hoku Lei. So it's possible we'll see some construction, if not this coming year, then certainly in coming years, adding new facilities. And of course, we'll want to make sure that the lighting that's installed is, is uh, compliant uh, from the get-go. Um, and uh, that's about all I have, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks. Uh, this is Jim Jacoby. I got a, a question. Um, in, in your report, you indicate that you you contracted a, a, a nonprofit to do your searches, um, not knowing who those are. Um, uh, you know, what what kind of criteria did you use to ensure that they've got the skill set to be able to do that properly? And then, how did how did what kind of training was 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 uh, conducted to to make sure again that they were able to do that? Okay. The uh... The organization that we um, used at Port Allen was uh, is called the Kauai Community Science Center, and this is a nonprofit that um, uh, you know tries to get uh, students, uh, high school and college students, uh, to take a strong interest in science. Um, and I happen to uh, you know know about the organization. I thought it would be a good fit to have some highly motivated individuals. Uh, you know, get involved in this type of, a, of an activity. And I, I also knew the, uh, the director of the um, organization. So we invited them to, um, you know, uh, bid on the uh, contract and we met with them and talked, th talked through with them. And I met uh, several of the kids and I was really struck by their interest um, and their, again, their motivation. And, uh, you know, at all our other facilities, we have uh, security guards doing the searching. And, um, you know, I, I think they did a fine job. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they were dedicated searchers. It wasn't just, you know, in the course of their normal uh, duties that they happened to look for seabirds. They set, a, they set apart time during the uh, during their shifts to focus solely on searching for seabirds. Um, but, you know, they, they also had another job to do as well. And so we felt that these, uh, this was a really good opportunity to uh, uh, team up again with motivated uh, folks um, who were looking for a, an educational experience. We gave them the same training that we gave the security guards. Um, and I have to say, I was very impressed by their uh, performance, not just the fact that, as I said, they were finding birds that um, in areas where technically they weren't even required to be searching, um, but also the, you know, the completeness of the reporting that they did, you know, everybody had to, all the searchers had to complete a log every, every night documenting uh, both of the searches and uh, the amount of detail that they, uh, that they put into it. And not just looking for birds, but, you know, um, we also had them uh, documenting any predators that they identified during the searches, which is very useful information for evaluating our predator control. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's how we ended up with those folks. And I would say they did uh, at least as good a job uh, um, as, as our other searchers in terms of, um, uh, you know, completeness of the searches, completeness of their documentation. So we're really... Uh, Looking forward to working with them again next year and, and having uh, some of the same folks, but uh, possibly some new uh, uh, participants getting involved in the program. Great. No, that, that's exciting to hear. I, I, I think, you know, an opportunity to connect with groups like that is really good. You know, again, you know, ultimately it also comes down to just making sure, again, that there's consistency in terms of the searching. Um, I've got another question for you relative to your predator control. It, 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 you know, you indicate that that um, you initiate predator control. I guess at some of your facilities, uh, only if predators are are seen or observed. Um, knowing <laughs> how hard it is, by myself, knowing how hard it is to see uh, predators, uh, you don't see many of them. Um, you know, it, it seems like you know that 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 seems like a pretty low bar uh, trigger in terms of initiating predator control. Yeah, that, that's not actually the sole trigger. And again, the only facilities where that is the, um, the trigger to predator control are the, are the dark facilities. So the first trigger for doing predator control is, is the lights being on. Um, and if the facilities are dark for the entire season, then 
uh, then we're not going to do uh, predator control because we don't expect there to be any birds there. Um, but if they, if folks are going out there in the normal course of their business and spot, uh, happen to spot a cat um, uh, or other predator, uh, then that could also be a trigger for uh, them to put a trap out in hopes of catching a cat. Because obviously, you know, if they see, if they happen to see a cat, um, and then two nights later, uh, you know, they have to go out there and turn the lights on. We'd like to ha not have that cat there. The challenge with uh, you know, with those facilities is that they're not visited um, uh, every day. And I don't think, you know, yeah, we could just put a trap out and, um, you know, when we happen to get back there, uh, see if anything got caught, but um, that's not really a humane way to, to do predator control in terms of, you know, a cat potentially being in there for a week. Um, so uh, I think there's some trade-offs there in, in how we do things, but we do feel that, um, uh, it, you know, again, if the lights aren't on, that, um, you know, predator control is, is not uh, necessary. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, well, this is Lisa. Can you folks hear me? Yes. Um, so I actually have a question that would probably be better answered by the agencies and then maybe a bit by Alexander and Baldwin. But in the transfer and the sale of the solar facility, A, what, what do we know about the past incidents of downbirds there? Two, was it disclosed to the new purchaser that this property was part? of a HCP and three from the agency perspective, what is the what is the kind of path moving forward if there is known activity on this site for the solar farm? Um, maybe I can uh, take take a crack at responding first and then uh, if the agencies have something to add then um, uh, you know they can fill in the fill in the blank. So your questions are past incidents of down birds, uh, whether there was a disclosure. And um, I'm sorry, the third question sounded like it was more of a agency question. What was the third question again? Yeah, correct. The, the agency is like, what's the path forward with this property and the new owner if we know about past okay. down birds there? Okay, so hopefully my responses will help to address that third question. Um, we have, uh, and, and uh, the agencies can certainly correct me if I, you know, don't have the complete picture, but we have no uh, knowledge of any uh, downed birds at the solar farm. Um, I, I looked at the SOS data over the, you know, over the years, uh, obviously during the preparation of our PIP. And so I'm not aware of any documented downed birds uh, at the solar farm. Um, and let me just say that, uh, you know, that's the case for all of the McBride facilities. Um, but we felt since we were participating in the KSHCP uh, that there was no harm in adding those facilities to our, our permits uh, in case of, uh, you know, future circumstances where um, coverage became necessary. So um, I don't anticipate uh, that to happen. Um, but it's it's kind of like a security blanket for us. So no, there were there were there was there was no down bird activity to my knowledge at the Port Allen Solar Facility. Um, there very definitely was a disclosure to the uh, uh, purchaser of the of the property of our participation, including why we were participating. I.e., that um, it was not because we felt there was take going on there. Uh, but merely because, um, you know, since we were already in the KSHCP, it didn't seem like a significant additional burden for us to participate. Now, for, for them to participate as a standalone facility uh, would obviously, inc you know, uh, be a harder decision for them if they had no take. Certainly, if they had take, you know, maybe it becomes an easier decision. But, you know, it was disclosed to them and, you um, and, uh, you know, we gave them all the details they needed to, to make their own decision on whether to continue uh, to participate. 
Um, and then when the property was sold, uh, you know, we did a formal communication to the agencies, uh, notifying them that um, we were deleting them from our permit. So um, whatever was left unanswered by me, um, feel free to ask a follow-up or else, you know, the agencies can fill in the blanks. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. And Lisa, I'll just say that for Fish and Wildlife Service, the, the permit that each of the applicants have follows the owner, not the land. And so there is a process in the KSHCP that if they have land transfers or if they, if they sell their, their facilities to someone else, there's a process by which that happens and they let us know and that's what AMB did in this circumstance. We certainly can and will reach out to the new owner to talk about this with them, but there's no history of documented take at that facility. And so it's a little bit different than if it was a facility that had a, had a long history of documented take that we were particularly concerned about. But either way, we're gonna reach out to them anyway. Mahalo, Michelle, <laughs> that's helpful. So this is Loyal, I have a question. Thanks, Shauna, that was a uh, really useful, helpful discussion, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, Jim had mentioned you get concerns about the calculations of take, I, I do too, but you also presented an additional one, which is, okay, if, if they're out there and they find three additional birds or four additional birds that are off their site and those get turned into SOS, they should get credit for that, right? Um, I don't know what you mean by get credit. Well, uh, as um, uh, with respect to the take calculations, because those birds would have been lost if not well, for their surveys. If, again, I'm not, the, I'm not clear on what, what, the, uh, what you mean by get credit. Are you saying that birds found off our property should be charged, uh, considered a take by, by A and B? Um, well, I think there may be instances where that's the case, but that's not what I was talking about right now. I was talking about, you know, if you find a bird on your property and it's alive and it goes to um, SOS, then there is a quote unquote credit Oh, as right. the bird being released as far as your calculation back on your take oh, okay. level. So what I was saying was that if you find three birds that are not yours for take, uh, it seems like it might be reasonable to consider those being helpful in offsetting your existing take that was on your quote unquote property. Well, I'm all for that. Uh, I don't know that the, uh, I don't know that the KSHCP um, has a mechanism for doing that. Um, but uh uh, yeah, I mean, if that's, uh, if that's something that, uh, is implementable, um, uh, well then I, I guess I, I owe my searchers more than just a, you know, a little pizza lunch, like we gave them at the end of the season. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, that's a very interesting, uh, uh, suggestion and, um, you know, not something I had thought of, but, um, it, it's something we can, uh, we can kick yeah. around I, I think that I, I think that opens a really a, a can of worms because I mean I can uh, almost see somebody then contracting a group to go around the streets uh, uh, or you know, anywhere on the island and finding birds to to to, to get offset credit. Um, I think we need to think that one through a little bit. I'm just saying that I think we ought to think that one through <laughs> yeah. when we when we look at the overall <clears throat> assessment of the way the take is calculated because we also have the information from uh, you know rain on how much. SOS really may or may not contribute, you know, with the actual uh, the survival yeah. rate of the SOS birds. But I mean, this one is a uh, is something that makes sense. I mean, they got three birds or that probably would have died if they'd have just walked away from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you, no, now I, I see your point. I see your. I, I definitely see your point, Loyal. Uh, but but again, I think it's a bit of a head scratcher. We need to really think. You know, the implications I don't disagree. Of... And plus, when you've got KIUC having the funding for SOS as well, right. and you know, who gets credit for what? But I'm saying that 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 is something that I just don't want to blow off and say, right? Okay, they could have left them and been the same boat as if they would have caught them and brought them to right. SOS. And I'm not sure I I like that latter option of not getting credit for it. But anyway, I, that's for a future date. But that just wanted to voice my concern. 
Yeah, I have to say that, um, you know, we were kind of treating it as, a, you know, kind of like, a, you know, it's its own reward. Okay, you mm -hmm. saved a bird that might not otherwise have been saved. I mean, you know, feel, you know, get a nice warm, fun, fuzzy feeling from that. And if, if there's no tangible, uh, you know, payoff to that, well, then you still got your warm, fuzzy feeling. So right. I'm, I, you know, I think we are content uh, with the status quo, but I, I do think it's an interesting uh, uh, suggestion. Yeah, you Thank could you. create a market for down birds and people could drive around picking them up and get mitigation credits. I could see some conflicts on the road. <laughs> That's my bird. No, it's my bird. <laughs> that like new form of road rage. Oh, boy. Well, the one way to get uh, people to go around looking for birds to save. <laughs> anyway, interesting concept. We can uh, talk about that going forward. It's sort of like the bottle build in some ways. Yeah, shoot, man. <laughs> Yeah, you can't you can't throw a bottle on the street without somebody coming and picking it up and taking it to be redeemed. These are worth more than five cents. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Y'all, I'm happy to have the conversation, but there are some actual legal issues behind all of this that we need to talk about. Okay. So maybe we can find a time to get the get Linda and um, the Fish and Wildlife Service lawyer and we can talk about some of the components of that in a thoughtful way. Yeah, but I think the other the other issue too is is I think you you also alluded to it is is the fact that you know are those birds that potentially would be attributable to you know, your take too and how to sort that out I know is a real challenge and and we, we haven't come up with a good way to do that but it certainly is something worthy of of more discussion. Before we move on from A and B, Sean, I've been I, I haven't been involved in the day to day. Um, HCP management, but I have been told by both DOFA staff and Fish and Wildlife Service staff that they are very grateful for the work that AMB did this past season. I know that there was a lot of work related to dealing with the stuff with predator control and efficacy and a bunch of other conversations that happened. I just, I would be remiss if I didn't say something now that thank you for working through all of that and for taking some really positive steps forward over the 2020 season. Thank you. Well, thank you for your kind words. I appreciate it. And I'll pass it on to our team. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Okay. Okay, anybody else got uh, any other uh, comments or um, questions for A and B? Okay, thank you. Um, so this is probably going to be our last one. We're hoping to get a lunch break at 12, but um, uh, so we'll see what the timing is on this next one. But uh, so our next item up is a uh, Kauai County annual report. Dave, just as a heads up, I've got a switch at 1130 and I'll be out for half an hour and then come back. Okay. Good morning, all. William Trujillo from County of Kauai. Morning, William. Morning. I'll be uh, updating us, and I hope I don't last till noon, but uh, mm -hmm. let's, let's go. Um, so the slide on the on the screen uh, that Lindsay prepared um, as we just taking a step back, so refresh everybody's memory for County of Kauai. Total under the permit, we have 182 facilities. 60 are what we categorize as uh, category three and above. Uh, three, four, five, as you may recall, are the ones with lit facilities. Uh, depending on the degree of lighting, we had categorized them um, higher. Um, uh, categories one and two have no or very minimal lighting. Um, so we did, have, we did have staff do the search efforts, as was mentioned before in um, the lighting and facilities. We did a lot of our work was prior to 2020. Um, we, we modified all our lights to be compliant. Um, we changed policies so that all of our ball field lightings and a lot of what made category four and five, the play court lightings, our bigger uh, lights, we're all are all off during the fledgling season from September 15th to December 15th. Uh, that's been going on for a good number of years. 
uh, but that's uh, something that was done before. Um, uh, yeah, so we put about 5.6 million into redoing all of our lights to be compliant. And we still, as we go along, we make sure any new developments have for county on county properties are compliant. Um, as they're definitely very much a, a thought in terms of our staff and um, developing new projects. Uh, predator control, uh, we got a late start on it. Um, this past year, um, we did have a contractor on board from mid November to the end of the calendar year. Um, we worked out on four sites. Um, the training and outreach, so all of the staff um, are required to attend a training on our policy and a background on how we got here and the importance of the uh, policy and why we're doing it. Um, so it's so for the county this year is the first time we did an online uh, tracking of it. So every staff that um, has an email address was is receives a mandatory notice that he need he or she needs to attend it. It's an online training. So they do it at their own pace, at their own um, time, their own work time, uh, depending on, this, on their schedules. Um, those without emails or at remote sites, we had to do uh, modifications to it where we, gave, we brought the access to them, uh, whether it was a staff going out to do the actual training or getting them online access um, to the videos and to the materials. Everybody signed off on uh, receiving and acknowledging the policy and the training. Uh, so that's what that is. We did not receive any takes this year. Um, challenges is the late, like I mentioned, the late um, jump on the predator control. Um, some of the challenges for that is the vandalism to our predator uh, control contractors equipment and their processes. And then um, going forward, uh, we do plan on increasing the number of predator control and location, uh, the frequency and the locations. Um, I'm sorry, going back to also the lighting and facilities, what we, what, something else we also changed in the training and offered to the staff is uh, we did set up a new phone number and email if staff had any concerns or questions as they're doing their monitoring or off of the um, or off of the training uh, we had a I don't know if you want to I don't want to call it a hotline but we have an exclusive line for staff to be able to contact um, staff on that um, if they had any questions on that and for us to be able to track things a little bit better and for now I guess that's it I'm sure there's a handful of questions out there Any questions for Kauai County? Uh, this is Loyal. Uh, William, do you, I can't remember. Do you guys have beachfront property? Yes. Any turtle nests? Uh, yes, we have. Okay, we have beachfront property. Um, Mahia, our one of our county attorneys, is on here. I'm not sure what the status is of. Um, the nests are on our on our property or not? Adjacent well, the, to your property. Sorry, this is my hair. Um, we didn't have any honu on county property for the 2020 season. Any nests that were adjacent? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Mahea, it would be helpful if, if the annual report includes a summary of the items that the county is doing relative to turtles, and those items are listed in the KSHCP for the avoidance and minimization measures, just as a confirmation that the county continues to do that and continues to be in touch with DAR and the agencies relative to any nests that are reported by members of the public for county beaches. Absolutely. Thanks, Mahea. 
because I think like with the Sheraton, the, the turtle nest was probably not on Sheraton property, right? I assume it would have been on government property. I don't know the answer, Loyal. I think it because it depends on where the Sheridan property line is on right. the face, right? Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah, a, a question for you. This is Jim Jacoby with ESRC. Um, you're only searching, you know, once per day. And I, and I realize that, you know, the footprint for the county is, is pretty huge and there's some real challenges with doing that. Um, the, the, the concern I've got is, is searching once per day. I mean, that, that's a longer period of time that a bird potentially could be depredated or, or carcass removed or, 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 or hidden away even more so. Um, so I, I, do, I do have some concerns in terms of, 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 of you know, just making, and I, and I realize this is something that we're going to be getting into this year in terms of carcass removal tests and so forth. Uh, you know, but that is, that is a concern that I do have in terms of you know, the exposure time to, uh, for the for the carcasses to be removed before you find them. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. All righty. <clears throat> Let's see. I think um, Michelle had to drop out. And <clears throat> according to kind of our rough uh, scheduling, we, uh, we're we going to break after this item. Um, and DOT will come back next. But uh, Michelle has to drop out for a little while. So you guys want to just take a lunch break? here for a while and then um, start up again with DOT after lunch. Sure. What what time back? Uh, what do you think? 12, 15? Is that too late? That works. OK. Let's do, uh, yeah, let's do 12, 15. That'll give you 45 minutes for lunch. Great. Uh, thanks, Dave. Thank Mahalo. You. Thank you. Aloha. See you soon. <laughs>